So what about hell then? Where did all this come from? What is this doctrine? Now here you have some some popular views of of hell, right? You've got your uh, you've got your big demons, you've got your under demons torturing people, you've got people burning. You know this is this is the view that popular Christianity has put forward as the punishment for evil. But is that really what the Bible says? This is what we want to get at. What does the Bible say? There is a final destruction. Yes, there is. But it's not eternal. And this gets to the point, because that doctrine makes God, the doctrine of eternal hell, makes God into a monster. And is God a monster? Is he a monster? What does the Bible say? Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? All right, that's what the Bible says. If God takes no pleasure in the death of men and women, you know, that go to the grave, why would God have any pleasure in eternal torment? That doesn't make any sense. There is no false doctrine that has made more atheists than the idea that God is so cruel as to burn people in hell forever. It's a demonic lie. It's a doctrine of devils. It's perpetuated by the Antichrist system to rule people in fear. That is what it is. Well, welcome to this exclusive interview with Band.Video, sponsored by InfoWars and InfoWarsStore.com. I'm Brian Wilson with Red Pill TV, and today we're going to hell. I'm going to be joined by Marco Kolich, the director of Profits from Profits Ministry, a newly formed video outreach program dedicated to hearing, obeying, and proclaiming God's authentic prophesying. If you love the Bible and finding truth of the Bible, Marco Kolich and Profits from Profits Ministry is for you. So Marco, thank you for joining us. And if you don't mind giving a brief telling of Second Chronicles 2020, of where the name of your ministry comes from. Right. So thank you for having me on the show. It's a great privilege, and I appreciate uh, being able to reach out to, uh, to different people from all over the world. So basically the idea is that, you know, we should be profiting from the prophets. That's the basic idea of the ministry. As we, as we listen and as we learn from what the prophets have said, the prophets of the Bible specifically, the true prophets, the biblical prophets, then we're going to prosper. And that prospering is not, you know, necessarily going to be always on earth. The ultimate prospering is to get into the kingdom of heaven, to be with Jesus and our heavenly father forever. So that's, that's the goal, to get people to prosper right into the gates of heaven. Well, let's jump right into it. What is hell and what does hell mean in the Bible? Okay, so we're going to cover uh, a presentation that I call Hell Bent on hell, because some people seem to be hell-bent on having hell be as horrible as possible. And it's not a pleasant place, a pleasant event, that's to be sure. However, we want to stick to what the Bible actually says with regards to the human condition, the heavenly condition, and what happens on this earth, what happens to sinners, what happens to the righteous. So let's let's just move right forward. So the basic Catholic the doctrine of hell is this. Okay, this is in the. This comes from the uh, Catholic Catechism, uh, section ten thirty five. It says the teaching of the Church affirms the existence of hell and its eternity. Immediately after death, the souls of those who die in a state of mortal sin descend into hell, where they suffer the punishment of hell, eternal fire. Now, this is not only the Catholic doctrine. But most Protestants also believe in this basic definition of hell. Now, of course, Catholics, they will add purgatory, and most Protestants don't believe in purgatory. But when it comes to hell itself, this is the main idea. So in order to understand uh, why we are on this earth and what's going on and what the purpose of God is and man is and, and what's happening, why are we here? Why are we in this condition? Let's ask what is Satan's first lie? Now, we know Satan is the adversary of God. Jesus said Satan is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. So remember, Satan is a liar. So whatever Satan is saying, even when he's telling a partial truth, it's a lie. So what was his first lie? So we find in Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, it says this, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. The first lie of the devil is that there's no death. 
Now remember, God had told Adam and Eve, or he told Adam, that in the day that you eat thereof of this fruit, the fruit of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall die. You shall surely die. But Satan came and said, no, there's no death. No such thing as death. So Satan's first lie is that death is not death. That's the first lie. And this idea that death is not death is what prevails among most uh, commonly amongst uh, Protestants and Catholics. All right. But what did God say in response to Satan's first lie? What did he say? And unto Adam he said, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. God plainly said, and he defined what death is right here. It is a return to the dust. Okay? It's not going anywhere else. You're not roaming around haunting someone. Uh, you're not going to heaven. You're not going to hell. You're not going anywhere. You are going back to the dust. Genesis tells us immediately how God defines uh, death. All right? So we return to the dust. In other words, we don't have immortal souls. The Bible does not say that we have immortal souls because we return to the dust. So the question is, who do we want to believe? Right? Satan says there's no death. Okay? God says you return to the dust. So who do we believe? Well, I trust God. I don't trust Satan. That's how I look at it. I trust God. I don't trust Satan. Whatever Satan says is a lie, and it's there to get you lost. It's not there to save you or to help you. So now let's ask the question. Okay, so let's get some more information on death. Before we get into hell, we need to know what death actually is. So let's get some information. This is going to cover uh, the events in uh, John chapter 11 with respect to Jesus and Lazarus. Okay, when Jesus resurrected Lazarus. So Jesus said, and this is in John chapter 11, verse 11 to 14, and anybody can look all these texts up. This isn't stuff I'm making up. I'm getting it right out of the King James Version of the Bible. Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, said Jesus, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. So the disciples thought that, hey, Jesus is talking about Lazarus is he was sick, and now he's sleeping, so he must be sleeping, must be doing well. How be it? Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So Jesus equates death with a sleep, and the Bible equates death with a sleep, or death as a kind of sleep. And a sleep here, Jesus is talking about as a cessation of life, right? You have ceased to live. You're no longer alive. So when Lazarus died, Okay, he didn't go to heaven, he didn't go to hell, he didn't go to purgatory, he was in the tomb. And that is where he laid until Jesus resurrected him. Now, this accords exactly with the judgment of God in Genesis, with respects to where we go when we die. And I'll, I'll quote this text again, and I'll read the last bit, For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return, as we return to the ground. Lazarus here was dying, or had died, he'd been dead for four days, and he returned to the ground. And that's where Jesus came to resurrect him. That's so, so much better of a view to have than to picture my grandmother watching me from above everything I'm doing when I'm being intimate with my wife or when I'm going to the bathroom. It's such a just and reasonable perspective to picture the dead sleeping and not just watching over the uh, living and, and judging them. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it gives people peace because, look, I, I used to be a Catholic and, um, you know, I believed this same way. But then as I studied the Bible, I found out that that's not what the Bible says, that the Bible says that death is asleep and that that's peaceful to me. That's very peaceful. It's what God says is the truth. So the dead are sleeping. Um, let's take a look at a little bit more of the Jewish view and understanding of death. Again, this is still John chapter 11. And now Jesus is talking to Martha, okay? So when Jesus came, he found that he had laid in the grave four days already. So Lazarus had been in the grave four days already. Then Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. 
Martha understood the dead return to life at the resurrection, not before. Martha didn't say, I know Lazarus is looking down on me from heaven. She didn't say, I hope he's not in hell. She didn't say any of those things. She understood. Martha had a biblical view, not a heathen view of human nature, of life and death, right? Martha understood. And Jesus didn't correct her. Jesus didn't say, no, 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 I, he's in heaven. I have to call him down. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus, when he resurrected Lazarus, he simply didn't say, come up. He didn't say, come down. He said, come forth. That is, that's where he was laying, right in the grave. Okay? So let's ask this question here. This is interesting, interesting text. Where is David? Where is he? Is David in heaven? Well, what does the Bible say? For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep. Okay, there it is. Even, even uh, you know, here, here you have Jews. Remember, this is the New Testament, but these are still technically Old Testament Jews in a sense, right? This is Peter talking. He fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. Peter understands that death is asleep. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. So he knew he was talking about sleep and death is the same thing. And his sepulchre, sepulchre is with us unto this day. Now, this is the kicker. For David is not ascended into the heavens. He's not there. So let me tell you, David was the sweet singer of Israel. David was the, the king. If you, if you look, look up the word David in the Bible, there are so many references to David. So to think that people are going to go to heaven and David is still, you know, dust in his tomb, well, that doesn't make any sense. The Bible is very clear. When you die, you go to the tomb, you wait for the resurrection, you wait for the second coming. That is when people are resurrected. Now, of course, there are people uh, that are in heaven. Okay, we know that Enoch is in heaven. We know Elijah is in heaven. We know Moses is in heaven. And we know that when Jesus was resurrected, and you can look this up in Matthew 27, 53, or 73. No, no, that's 27, 53. Thank you. Um, is that Jesus, when he was resurrected, he actually brought people back out of the grave. So there was a bunch of resurrected people walking around Jerusalem after his resurrection. And when he went to heaven, he took those people to heaven. But these are resurrected people, right? They're not ephemeral souls wandering around the earth or some misty soul in some uh, ephemeral heaven that doesn't have any consistency. No, no. The Bible is very clear. Even though there are some people in heaven, they were resurrected. Elijah was translated. He never saw death. So he was translated. And these people are real physical people in heaven, resurrected or translated. But the rest of us have to wait for the second coming. So where is David? David is asleep in the tomb. He's not in heaven. And if he's not there, more than likely you're not going to get there either <laughs> until the second coming happens. That's what the Bible says. So, all right. So what happens in death then? Okay, well, what happens in the sleep? So let the Bible, not tradition, define the truth. Okay? For the living know that they shall die. So understand, the living know. Okay, the living know. How do you know? Because the living are alive, right? You've got your mind working, your eyes are working, your body's working. But the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So the dead don't know anything. Okay, also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. It's gone. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, no device, no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. The Bible, again, is clear. You go into the grave. When you die, you go into the grave. All right? This is what the Bible actually says. So, having understood now something of the human condition— that when you die, you go to the grave. You don't go to heaven. You don't go to hell. You rest in the tomb until the resurrection, until the second coming of Jesus arrives. So what happens then? So what is this hell? So what about hell then? Where did all this come from? What is this doctrine? Now here you have some some popular views of of hell, right? You've got your uh, you've got your big demons. You've got your under demons torturing people. You've got people burning. You know this is this is the view that popular Christianity has put forward as the punishment for evil. But is that really what the Bible says? This is what we want to get at. What does the Bible say? So what does the word hell mean? 
Okay, let's take a look. Now, remember, we're, I'm looking at the, uh, the King James Version, and other versions translate the word differently. But in the King James Version, which is the most popular, it's the one I use most of the time, because I love the King James. And what does the word hell mean? So let's take a look. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, Sheol, which is the Hebrew word in parentheses there. That's the Hebrew word. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Okay, that's Psalm 16, verse 10. Okay? So we know that this is a psalm talking about Jesus, because Peter quotes that psalm. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Now, in Greek, it's Hades, because this is the, this is the New Testament written in Greek. Neither wilt thou suffer the Holy One to see corruption. Now, Peter, he's referring to Christ here. So we know Psalm 1610, that's referring to Jesus. Acts 227, referring to Jesus. And so where did Jesus go when he died? He didn't go to hell. He went into the tomb. Christ was laid in hell, Sheol in the Hebrew, Greek, it's Hades, but both mean the grave. That's what it means. That's a very it's common simple. misconception or view, I should say, out there is that Jesus went to a pagan style Hades, hell, deep underground, surrounded by people being tortured by demons. I feel like that is very, very perspace, uh, pervasive view out there. Do you, would you speak to that? Yeah. Um, in fact, I... In my video that I do on on, uh, on YouTube, you can see my videos on YouTube, I go into more detail with that particular idea that Jesus went to hell because it talks about the souls that Jesus went to and, and speaking to the souls. But the context of that verse is talking about those antediluvians before the flood and that in essence, Christ was preaching to them through Noah. So they were the souls in prison, okay? There weren't souls in hell burning in a prison. That's, that's not what the Bible is saying, because you have to take on any doctrine. You have to take the fullness of Scripture to understand what it says. You also have to understand how the Bible writers wrote. They wrote metaphorically. They wrote poetically. So you have to be able to look at plain texts that tell you the exact uh, truth, and then you look at these other texts, which may have some difficulty in understanding, but when you compare them both, you'll get the idea, right? So that's a short piece on that. I go into that in much more detail in, um, uh, you know, the, my same hell doctrine uh, we'll link exposition. to your other videos below and below this video once it's posted, but please continue with your uh, presentation. All right. So, so this is what it means. The word hell simply means the grave or the tomb. Okay, Hades and Sheol. Now, there is the idea, you know, Hades is supposed to be some shadowy place where the dead go, but that's the Greek idea. That's not, that's not how the Bible is using the word. The same with Sheol. It could be some dark place where people go, but that's, again, those are heathen ideas. The, the word means grave. That's all it means. So let me ask a question. Can hell be destroyed? If hell is eternal, it shouldn't be able to be destroyed, right? But here we have a problem. And death and hell, that is Hades, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Well, Revelation 2014 tells you that hell is going to be destroyed. So how can a place of ever burning, right? How can a place of ever burning, a place of torment, ever burning all the devils, how can that place be then cast into a lake of fire to be destroyed? That doesn't make any sense. Of course not, because that idea, that doctrine doesn't make any sense. It's not biblical. The Bible here uses the plain word death and Hades. So death and Hades are going to be cast into the lake of fire. That's the lake of judgment at the last day after the thousand years. We're going to get into that in a second. So that means hell doesn't last forever because death and hell is cast in the lake of fire. So hell cannot be eternal right then and there. It's not eternal. It tells you right there. It has an end. Okay. Because death and hell, hell being the grave. And when Jesus comes to resurrect his people, that's it. He's destroyed Hades, the grave. And we can see this too, uh, this type of, of um, proper translation here in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, Hades, okay, where is thy victory? So here, grave is translated as Hades. This is again King James Version. So we have to be able to tease out 
the underlying uh, interpretation of words. So when you read hell, you read things like this, you have to understand that the word literally means and is used in the Bible as the grave. Now, there are other words that are, in, that are interpreted in the King James as hell. Okay, so what about Gehenna? Gehenna is also a word that is used to uh, translate it as hell, all right? So this comes from Enhanced Strong's Lexicon. Okay, so this is Gehenna. Uh, it's a Hebrew word that's used in, in the Greek as well. So it's a, hell is a place of future punishment, okay, called Gehenna or Gehenna of fire. Now, this was originally the Valley of Henon, south of Jerusalem, where filth and dead animals of the city were cast out and burnt as a fit symbol of the wicked and their future destruction. Okay, this is an enhanced Strong's lexicon. So what you can understand what this what is saying here, and I'll I'll show you the example. Let me just go to the example, and it'll it'll give you an idea. So hell, or in this version, or in this word Gehenna, is place of judgment or judgment. All right. You can look up the history of the Valley of Hinnom in the Bible. Um, for example, and I, I have a little quote here that I put on the side, uh, and he defileth Topheth, which is the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. That's 2 Kings 23, verse 10. In other words, the Valley of Hinnom was a place of judgment because that is where they used to bring their children to sacrifice to Molech by fire. So God laid that place waste and it became a place of judgment. So in other words, when somebody told you to go to hell or go to Gehenna, that is go to that place of burning judgment, but it didn't doesn't mean forever and ever and ever. Now we're going to get into that in a second. All right, so this is another use of the word Gehenna. It's in James chapter 3 verse 6. And it says, "And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body." and set it on fire, the course of nature, and it is set on the fire of hell. That's the word used there. So, does the tongue, if you say bad things, does the tongue literally set everything on fire? No, it doesn't do that. The Bible is using it metaphorically. Okay, it's judgment. The context determines the meaning, and that's what we have to look at Scripture. The context of Scripture, the greater context of Scripture, the immediate context of the text itself, that determines the meaning of the words. So let's take it, like for example, let's deal with the idea of something being forever in the Bible. Okay, let's deal with that. Does the term forever always mean forever? All right, we have to look at what the Bible says. For example, in Exodus 21, verses 5 to 6, it says this. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children. So this is a person that had sold themselves they had to pay some debts, or they, they came to financial trouble. They sold themselves to someone to serve them. Then it says, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges, and he shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, that is, put a spike in his ear, and he shall serve him forever. So the question is, does the slave follow the master forever? Is it literally forever? No. It only lasts until the end of life. So the context determines what the Bible means. So forever doesn't always mean forever. The context will tell you what it means. So forever doesn't always mean forever. So when does it really mean? When does forever really mean everlasting? Okay, that's a question. Let's take a look. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. So the context here is God's throne, which will never be destroyed. So then obviously we can take the term forever to mean forever, without eternity or without end and for eternity. It means exactly that. The context determines the true time frame of such terms as forever. So now we deal with eternal fire. Right. This is uh, this is this is the point. Hell is supposed to have eternal fire. But what is eternal fire? Remember, the context determines what the Bible means when using the words eternal, forever, and that type of thing. So let's read Jude seven. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication 
and going after strange flesh are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. This is not regular fire. It's eternal fire. Does Sodom and Gomorrah still burn today? No, it doesn't burn today. But it still suffered eternal fire. So what's going on? Well, this is what's going on. Eternal fire is fire that cannot be quenched until its fuel runs out. Okay? So when the Bible talks about, and we're going to get into this text a bit later, about, you know, their, their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. What does it mean to quench? To quench is to put out, right, to put out before the fuel runs out. If a fireman comes to a home in time, he can quench the flames. If a fire, a home that's on fire. If a home is on fire and the firemen don't get there, will the fire still burn forever? No, it'll burn as long as there's fuel. But the thing is, eternal fire cannot be quenched. It can't, you can try to put as much water on it as you want. You can try to put as much, uh, uh, you know, anti, anti uh, fire retardant as you want. It'll never go out until it's finished burning what it wants to burn, what God wants it to burn. So let's switch here for a second, and let's go into the teachings of Jesus for a moment on the rewards and punishment. What does Jesus teach about reward and punishment? So what is the reward of faith? All right, what does the Bible say is the reward of faith? So this is John chapter 3, this is verse 15 and 16. This is verse 15. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So what is the reward of faith but everlasting or eternal life? Now, in this context, when God gives you everlasting life, this is everlasting. This is forever. Once God gives you this, it is forever life. It is forever and ever. And we can thank God for that. And I praise God for that as a Christian. I say amen to that. And this is a beloved text. Everyone knows John 3, 3 uh, 16, especially. But now, what is the reward of unbelief in Christ? And we're going to use the same text. Okay, now what does the Bible say? What does Jesus say? Same text, different emphasis. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. All right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, this is in contrast. Those that believe get everlasting life. So, what the wicked would receive, or those that unbelievers, they would receive the opposite of ever everlasting life, which is to perish. It's to perish. It is to be done away with, to be destroyed. That's right. So, what does, for example, the meaning of the word perish? What is the meaning of the word? Well, this is from um, the New American Standard Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek Dictionary. Okay, so let's take a look at the word perish. Apollomai, or I think it's pronounced Apollomi. Uh, to destroy, to destroy utterly, destroy, destroyed, end, killed, ruined, perish, to be perishable. When something perishes, that means it's not there anymore. It goes away, right? So here it is from the Dictionary of Biblical Languages with semantic domains. And it, the same idea, destroy, ruin, cause destruction. Uh, lose life, die, disappear, cease to exist. That is the meaning of the word perish. It's to cease to exist. So when Jesus says that those who are faithful and believing have eternal life, and that the implication of those that don't believe will perish, that is they will cease to exist. There comes a time when the wicked cease to exist. Okay, let's take a look again. I hate to what steal your thunder, say? but I love how you lay out in your video uh, that if you were to be tortured endlessly for an endless amount of time in hell, then you would technically have everlasting life. You would just have everlasting life in torture. And so yeah. that's such an important point to make that the reward for the believers is everlasting life. If the wicked were giving everlasting life in torturous hell, they would still have a reward of everlasting life. I just love that point you made, and I'm sure you're going to get to it, but please continue. Yeah, yeah, and, and exactly that. And it's okay if you steal my thunder, uh, because <laughs> the Lord the Lord is, is to be praised. It's his truth. It's not, you know, it's not me, it's him. And this is exactly the point. That's exactly the point. 
right, uh, that Jesus is making. So when we take a look at this, what is the reward of the sheep versus the goats? What does Jesus say? Okay. Then he said, and this is uh, Matthew 25. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as you have done, you have, insomuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So eternal life is contrasted with eternal punishment. The punishment cannot include eternal life, as that is the exclusive reward of the righteous. Okay? It's the punishment that the result of the punishment is eternal. There's no coming back from this. Jesus can resurrect you right now. If you died, Jesus could resurrect you. We know this because in the Bible, Jesus resurrected people that had died. But this particular punishment, when people face the final punishment, they cannot be resurrected. There is no coming back. It's final. The righteous get final judgment, eternal life. The wicked get final judgment, eternal destruction. They cease to exist. And we're going to see that in a little bit here. But I want to go through one more one more little parable that, that Jesus gives, and that's the straight gate versus the broad road. Okay, what does Jesus say? Enter you at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way. That leadeth to what? Eternal life in hell? No, that's not what the Bible says. That leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. What does it mean to be destroyed? It means to cease to exist, to be gone, dead, removed from existence. Jesus says, because the straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto what? Life. And few be there that find it. Matthew 7. So you can tell that Jesus is consistent. All right? The faithful, the sheep, the straight gators, what did they receive? Everlasting life. Life eternal. Life. What did the unbelieving, the, the goats and the broad roaders, what did they get? Well, they perish. They cease to exist. Right? They get everlasting punishment. They get destruction. Does it look like the wicked live on forever? Or does it look like they're destroyed? They are destroyed. That's what the Bible says. That is what the Bible says. You know, destruction is bad enough on its own. And it has a context also that I don't have time to get into on, on the subject, but we're going to get into a bit more. The fact of the matter remains that we don't need to make hell eternal to get people to believe in Jesus, to get people to turn to be turned around. That is not the motivation that God wants. There is a punishment. It is bad. Absolutely. Okay? But we don't need to add to it to make people turn around to Christ. Jesus said, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. It is the love and mercy of Jesus that draws us to him. Yes, In fact, are. the false doctrine of hell pushes people away from being interested in God. They see him as cruel and unjust and intolerant to torture you endlessly for all time. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And we're going to get into that a little bit later. Because really, and I'll say this now, this doctrine of hell is the doctrine that makes the most atheist. And I can understand people who don't want to believe in a God and who have a hard time trusting a God that will burn people in hell forever. I know people have done terrible, horrible, evil things. That's true. There is much evil in the world, and it, and it will be adjudicated by the justice of God. But we don't want to stretch God's justice out to the point where it becomes evil itself. And we're going to address that in just a, a little bit here. So Jesus is consistent, all right? The opposite of life is death. The reward is everlasting life. The, the, re, the reward for faith, the reward for unbelief is to perish and be destroyed. So what does it mean? Where does this perishment or this destruction come from? Where do we see that in the Bible? Okay, let's take a look at Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. It says this, For behold, the day cometh. Now, I want to stop right there. The day cometh. From the perspective of this prophet, and I want to profit from the prophet, Right? We're talking about the prophets here. We're talking about what does the Bible say? The prophets who wrote the Holy Word of God. He says, Malachi says, for the day cometh, that is, it is not yet, 
that shall burn as an oven. So it's not yet from the prophet's perspective. It isn't there yet. There is no hell. And all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. Well, that hasn't happened yet. And the day that cometh, so it comes in the future, shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear the name of, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be as ashes under the soles of your feet. In the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord. So in the day that it, this is done, at a day future, at a future time. As Christians, we need to profit from the prophets, believe what they say. Don't believe what man says. Don't believe what tradition says. Don't believe what the world says. Don't believe what Hollywood says, you know, painting Satan with big horns and scary teeth. and but That's not what Satan looks like. Satan looks like an angel of light. Yeah, okay, from my understanding of like. the Bible, Satan is a beautiful creature. He's one of God's, one of his highest creations that happened to turn against him. But he's not mm -hmm. a ugly, grotesque creature, according to the Bible. He is a beautiful creature. That's correct. And that's the best way to actually fool people. You know, um, let's be honest. When it comes to the depictions of Satan, you know, it's always dark and pentagrams and things like that. And yeah, that's that's Satan's side. That's true. But that's the obvious side, which is easy to avoid. Right. It's, it's if some creature comes into your house looking with horns and fangs and a monstrous form and bat wings, uh, I would be very reluctant to follow that. But yes, exactly. He's more seductive. He can also be more seductive is what we're getting at. And, and that's that's where Satan really lives in the seduction side, the 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 crass, dark, gothic side. It, it attracts a certain group, but really, what gets most people is the seduction side. That's what gets people. And here, the Bible plainly tells us what what that lake of fire that we read about already in Revelation chapter twenty. What that lake of fire is? It's a day that comes in the future. It will burn as an oven. All the proud and wickedly will be stubble. That is, they're done. They're done away with. They're not burning forever. They're stubble. Okay? So when is that day? When and where is it? When do, where and when does that happen? Revelation, this is, uh, this is Revelation here. And it says, and when the thousand years are expired. So when and when the thousand years have expired. So there's a thousand year period in Scripture. I don't have time to get into the full significance of what that is. But in any ways, after a thousand-year period, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is the sand of the sea. So this is happening on earth, okay? This is happening on earth. And this is happening at a future time on earth. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. So Satan doesn't rule hell. Satan himself is going to be destroyed in the lake of fire. Satan is not ruling, torturing people. Again, this idea that God is allowing the devil to rule hell and torture people is ridiculous. Satan is the chief of sinners. Why would God allow the chief of sinners to rule the place of hell and torture people on top of that? Again, that's not in Scripture at all. So I go on. Where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, this is where people get tripped up. Remember... What does ever and ever mean? It depends on the context. All right? And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell, that is Hades or the grave, uh, delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The day that burns as an oven is the lake of fire. The whole world will be set on fire. God will set this whole world on fire. And the wicked that have remained there, because they had been just resurrected, okay, the wicked had been resurrected, and now executive judgment is now pronounced upon them. They, they were already guilty because they're wicked, but now the sentence is being done. So now God is executing the sentence that he said would be done to the wicked, and that is the day has come that's burning like an oven, and they are all going to be stubble, including the devil. 
including the devil. They're all going to be stubble. So key points just to wrap up this point here. The day that burns as an oven, the lake of fire, does not happen until after a thousand-year period of Revelation 20. The lake of fire happens on the earth. We know this because it talks about the four quarters of the earth and the dead are taken out of the sea and their graves. Okay? So they're taken out of the sea and the graves. So these are the ones that have died, the wicked that were left on earth. Only after the thousand years is all the earth, the wicked, Satan, and his devils are burnt up. There is no burning hell right now. That's the point. It does not exist. There is no burning hell. There is no eternal burning hell, and there is no lake of fire right now. It's not happened yet. When we die, we go to the tomb, we go to the grave, and we rest until the second coming of Christ. And then Jesus will resurrect his righteous and translate his righteous, take them to heaven. And you can read this in in 1 Corinthians 15, some of it. And uh, I believe it's 2 Thessalonians, the the text uh, leaps out of my head right now. But the Bible is very clear. Once this thousand years happens, then you have the destruction of hell. Now let's go over a few texts that seem to say hell is a place of eternal torment. Okay, let's go over that just, just real quick. So there, I picked I picked four here. There's Isaiah 66, 24, Mark 9, 34 to 44, which is actually just Jesus quoting Isaiah, that previous text. And then there's uh, Revelation 20, 10 and Revelation 14, 10 to 11. All right, you can see them there on your screen. So let's take a look at Isaiah 66, 24. Does Isaiah say that people are going to burn in hell forever? So here's the text again. I'll just read it. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring to all flesh. So people say, aha, there it is, right? Ever burning hell, there it is. That's not what the Bible is saying. You have to take all the scripture, determining the context of truth. What is a carcass? It's a dead body. Is a dead body thinking, screaming, crying? If it is, it's not dead. It's a living person, right? The dead know nothing. We already read that. That's what the Bible says. These are carcasses. At worst, if you want to believe this is an eternal burning hell, then it's eternal burning carcasses that feel nothing and do nothing. And that seems kind of useless. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's kind of ridiculous to think in that that, uh, kind of direction. So, do carcasses feel anything? Do they think anything? Do they know anything? No, they don't. So, And so now let's take a look at the worm. What is it that does not die? It doesn't say the carcasses don't die. The carcasses are dead people. It says, for their worms shall not die. So it's the worms that don't die. All right? It's not not the carcasses. It's not people. It's the worms. But remember, why aren't the worms dying? What do worms do to a carcass? They eat it until there's nothing left. The same with the fire. The worm in this text is an agent of corruption and decay such as the fire is an agent of destruction and purification. That is what Isaiah is saying. Basically, the fire will not be quenched. Remember I talked about quench, is when you put it out ahead of time. This fire cannot be quenched because it will have to to consume wickedness and the wicked all up. So what Isaiah is doing is using metaphorical language to describe, basically, the day that burns as the oven. It's going to burn everybody up, and no one can put that fire out until it's finished doing what it's doing. That's all that that means. So does Isaiah say that people are going to burn in hell forever? No. No, he does not. And then the question is, does Jesus say that Isaiah says that people are going to burn in hell forever? Well, Jesus is quoting Isaiah. This is Mark 9, 34 to 44. All right. And Jesus is quoting Isaiah. He's quoting that same text. He says, and the fire shall never be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. So obviously Jesus is following along with the idea of Isaiah, using that metaphorical language. Jesus is quoting Isaiah. The answer is no. Jesus Jesus is not saying people are going to burn in hell forever. Jesus says, remember, or you can see there, it says, to enter into life. Life is contrasted with the carcasses, right? It says at the top of the text, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that will never be quenched. So again, Jesus is consistent. Life is given to the righteous. Death, destruction is given to the wicked. The only, only the righteous get eternal life, not the wicked. And the wicked certainly don't get eternal life in hell. 
because that's still giving eternal life, which is not what the Bible says. All right. So these are the texts. And we, so we've dealt with the first two. And in essence, we've dealt with the other ones. Because remember, forever is only as long as the fuel lasts. So when it says, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. These people are destroyed. The Bible says they will be a stubble. They will be as ashes under the soles of the feet of God's people. Once the fire is finished burning on this earth, it's over. It cannot be quenched, so it lasts forever as long as there's fuel. But when the fuel runs out, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, not burning today, when the fuel runs out, that's it. That's it. So all of these texts, none of them. And here where it says the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. Yeah, in essence, the smoke does go up forever and ever. The smoke keeps going up and up and up and, and it keeps dissipating, but it's the smoke of their torment. That is, they have burnt up, they've been destroyed, wickedness is done on the earth, and now it's over. It's over. They have no rest day and night. Of course not. While they're burning, while they're being destroyed, and the Bible does give the idea, I forget this text exactly where Jesus says it, but Jesus says, you know, to, to whom much is re- given, much is required. In other words, what Christ is saying in the end is that Satan and his angels will burn longer than people, and certain people will burn longer than other people, depending on the amount of evil you've done on this earth. That is what will take time to burn up. Some people are destroyed in a moment. You know, some people never had a chance to learn about Jesus. Uh, even in the Old Testament, you could still learn about God, but some people didn't have enough light, really, and they, whatever that little bit of light they had, they didn't turn to it. So to little that they were required, they didn't live up to that. So some people are not going to be, you know, destroyed over a period of days or, or hours. It could be seconds, just gone, because they never had that, uh, never had that experience. But that's something that we can get into, you know, on, on a later discussion. Suffice it to say, these texts seem to say that, uh, that you go to hell and that you burn, but it's not true, okay? So there is no eternal hell. That doctrine is simply not biblical. It is not true. But the Bible does say that there is a destruction. There is a final destruction. Yes, there is. But it's not eternal. And this gets to the point, because that doctrine makes God, the doctrine of eternal hell makes God into a monster. And is God a monster? Is he a monster? What does the Bible say? Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? All right, that's what the Bible says. If God takes no pleasure in the death of men and women, you know, that go to the grave, why would God have any pleasure in eternal torment? That doesn't make any sense. There is no false doctrine that has made more atheists than the idea that God is so cruel as to burn people in hell forever. It's a demonic lie. It's a doctrine of devils. It's perpetuated by the Antichrist system to rule people in fear. That is what it is. Yes, this definition of hell is not only biblical, but it makes God into a just uh, judge. And the what you reap is what you sow. You're, the amount of wickedness is the amount of punishment in that everlasting fire. So another question I wanted to pose to you is, why do you think Satan would issue this false doctrine of hell, the chief of liars? Why would he want to misrepresent God's ultimate judgment? Well, a couple of reasons for that. Number one, it makes people think that God is a monster and they won't turn to God. So, and therefore be lost because they believe a lie. When you believe the devil's lie, irrespective of what the Bible says, then, then you, face, you face being lost. Okay, false doctrine leads people to be lost. Let's, let's not mince any words here. False doctrine will lead people to be lost. The other thing with this doctrine is that it's connected to the idea of an immortal soul. And what that allows is for Satan to appear as people that have departed, oh, my, my, my dear departed son, or my wife, or whatever, you know? And then Satan can appear as that person because the person believes that when you die, you go to heaven or you hell, or you can come back, or you're wandering around, or you can become a ghost, and all these things. Satan wants that so that people will listen to him 
and his lies instead of what the Bible says. So those are two reasons why Satan has created this horrible. And that brings us back to the first lie that he told, you surely shall not die. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I just want to end on on these two, these last two slides here. Um, when we look at God, yes, there is a future fiery destruction of the wicked. Uh, it will be most terrifying and painful. This, there's no way around it. Okay, but it will not last forever. Men and women who reject the offer of eternal life will suffer permanent destruction by their choice. They will not want to be in heaven because they don't want the love and the mercy of God. They don't want it. That's what people are refusing. So they're not going to get eternal pain and suffering. God's plan is to bring an end to sin, not perpetuate it for an eternity while people writhe in agony as they curse God forever. Is God a monster? No, he's not a monster. I'll tell you who's a monster. Satan's a monster. Satan is a monster. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The good news is that no one needs to experience this destruction. We don't need to experience it. There's plenty of Jesus to go around. He is the Savior of mankind. He saved us. While we were yet sinners, he loved us. This is the great love of God. And this is why this doctrine is so horrible, because it totally takes away from the love and beauty of Jesus and the Father. And all of heaven, heaven is a place where people, where, where angels look down on us and with love, not hatred and anger. Heaven is not an angry place. Heaven is a loving place. The day comes where God will have to punish the wicked, but right now we have great mercy, and now's the time to turn to Christ. Now's the time to give our lives to Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us. You, you can follow all of his work at Prophet from Prophets Ministry. I'll link that below. And just like he said, now is the time. There's no better time. And uh, you don't have to clean up your act before you turn to God. Just do that now, and then he'll help you the rest of the way. So, Marco Kolich, thank you for joining us. And you have any final words you'd like to say to the InfoWars Band video audience? Well, I would like to say that uh, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe in his prophets, so shall you prosper. Amen. Amen.